Ethics of Care, adapted by Rachel Edelman. Introduction. The ethics of care holds that the way humans live in a relationship with each other is essential to humanity. Ethics of care was first identified in the 1970s and 1980s within the context of the the feminist movement. At that time, many psychologists, philosophers, and legal scholars were concerned with the ways in which much of moral philosophy discounted interpersonal relationships. American psychologist Carol Gillian published research that proposed an ethical framework that valued intimacy, responsibility, relationships, and caring for others. American philosopher Nell Noddings then asserted that, because caring is the foundation of all human relationships, caring relationships are universal, applicable to all humans, and arise from within the self. Rather than seeking to answer what is the right thing to do, the ethics of care asks, how can I be a good person by placing value on caring relationships? The main idea. No human survives without cooperation. The ethics of care asks that we focus on the primacy of relationships because we are fundamentally interdependent beings. In the ethics of care, interdependence, living in caring relationships with other humans, is of primary importance. Applying the ethics of care to practical situations requires knowing and understanding yourself and your relationships to others, then making decisions with those relationships in mind. Context is key. No one decision is right for everyone, and individuals' relationships have to determine their decisions. In the ethics of care, we are expected to prioritize the actions that will preserve and protect caring relationships, while applying respect for all for others to all relationships. There is no absolute right or wrong. It requires negotiation. As Nottings asserts, Relationships require time to develop and are not defined by their biological nature. A teenager might have a stronger bond with their elderly neighbor than they have with their estranged grandparent due to the amount of time they spend with their neighbor and the experiences they share together. If the neighbor was celebrating their retirement on the same day as the estranged grandparent's birthday, the teenager might choose to celebrate with the neighbor. That's perfectly welcome within the ethics of care. There are some decisions that are advisable impulses, and there are others that are required duties. In order for the impulse to care to transform into the duty to care, there are two conditions. One, there must be a relationship with the other person. And two, the relationship must have the potential to grow into a mutually caring relationship. A quick note to avoid a common error. This does not mean that an individual cannot share cannot care for those to whom they are not in a relationship. However, it does place a higher priority on more proximate, closer relationships. For example, if you were in a ride chair and were in an accident in which you were not hurt, you would still have a duty to care for another passenger who might be unable to walk. That duty could be carried out in many ways, such as calling 911 or if you're trained and capable, administering medical care. Ethics of care demands that we act with caring relationships in mind. Roles in caring relationships. Sometimes we have duties to two people and it's impossible to do a good job of fulfilling both of our duties, or excuse me, our duties to both. We have to choose. So how do we prioritize relationships? First, we have to consider the nature of those caring relationships and our roles within them. There are relationships with more than two people involved, but for simplicity's sake, we'll start by thinking about particular relationships between two individuals. According to Nell Noddings and other care ethicists, each relationship of care involves at least two individuals, the one caring and the cared for. Those roles might change over time, but in any single moment, moment, the one caring anticipates and responds to the needs of the cared for in the context of that particular caring relationship. 
The one caring notices what is happening in the experiences of the cared for and is motivated to act in an anticipation of the cared for individual's needs. Of course, that doesn't mean that the one caring always does what the cared for wants. A crying baby might be hungry, but the parent might first take a whiff of their diaper to see if they need a change. Humans are intelligent creatures, but we're not mind readers. The one caring consistently seeks to help and support the cared for, and the practice of anticipating another's, another person's needs cultivates a sense of empathy for the other and anticipation for the other's needs. Roles in caring relationships can be close to equal, and they can also change over time. Consider the parent-child relationship. When the child is young, it is obvious that the child is cared for and the parent is the one caring. The parent soothes, it, soothes the child, feeds them, plays with them, and changes lots and lots of diapers. As the child gets older, they're able to do more for themselves. They progress from bottle feeding to holding their own spoon to perhaps heating up a can of chicken noodle soup for a parent with the flu. Maybe there will be years when the parent and the child hold a nearly equal relationship and they engage in reciprocal caregiving. But if the parent and child are lucky and the parent lives into old age, their roles will eventually reverse. The child will become the one caring and the parent the cared for. When parents are, excuse me, when parents care for, for children, both parties benefit. Roles can toggle back and forth. If Mr. Kimura has a stomach flu today, but his partner has one tomorrow, their roles can switch. In a close and relatively equal relationship, we can be both the one caring and the one cared for at the same time, no matter the relationship. When people in society care for each other, everyone can gain. Evaluating Caring Relationships As the great Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy wrote, quote, All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Unquote. Not all family relationships or friendships are happy, healthy, or otherwise good. The ethics of care recognizes that not all relationships are equal. The ethics of care uses the values of trust and mutuality to evaluate caring relationships. Trust is one value we're familiar with at Seattle Academy. Marianne Webster defines it as belief that someone or something is reliable, good, honest, effective, etc. In a relationship, trust means feeling confident that someone has your back. Consider the relationship between siblings. When you're young and your sibling live in the same house, fight for parents' attention, excuse me, consider the relationship between siblings. When you're young, you and your sibling live in the same house, fight for parents' attention, and maybe help each other out sometimes. When you're little, you might fight with each other because you're jealous of the other's teddy bear or iPad game, because your children, with limited understanding of the world and little to no control over your environment, you imagine yourself in competition for limited resources of your parents' time and attention. But as you grow older, things will likely change. The two of you might go to school go to school, encounter the same teachers, and face the same obstacles. As the time goes on, you might help each other out more and more. Each of those acts builds a trusting relationship. Of course, acts of betrayal can impede that trust. If you hear your siblings gossiping about you to your latest crush, that, that's a clear breach of trust. But with time and consistency, that trust can be repaired. Mutuality is sharing of feelings, actions, or relationships between people. It makes trust possible and strengthens trust between people. Mutuality exists in formal ways, such as in contracts, in which people sign their names and agree to cooperate, as well as in informal ways, such as friends who carpool to school together every morning. Shared experiences create shared bonds. Now, let's evaluate a scenario based on our understanding of trust and mutuality. 
Consider a parent-child relationship between a ruler of a kingdom and his young adult son. This might look familiar. The ruler and his son have a long history of caring, with the father as the one caring and the son the cared for. They've even fought in a war together, building plenty of trust and mutuality along the way. Now, with the son as an adult, the relationship is becoming more equal. But then, the father catches his son's fiancée disobeying a law. It is a serious law, and the punishment is death. And yet, the son believes the father is being unjust. He goes to his father and argues his case, and his father treats him like a child, failing to consider his son's opinion or argument. The girlfriend is put to death anyway. Prior to the girlfriend's actions, the father and the son had a long history of trust and mutuality, based on shared experience and caring. Yet, one event changed all of that. Even though that history is still there, the son now believes that the father breached his trust and disregarded their mutuality. On the other hand, the father believes that the son breached his trust by violating his laws and displaying insubordination. Now that the event has occurred, it has severed the father and son's caring relationship. A breach of trust of the, of that magnitude has severed the relationship it could not be, it could be repaired, but is unlikely to be improved anytime soon. Note that the ethics of care can't conclusively tell us who is right or wrong, but it is a powerful tool for analyzing the situation. It's a method of analysis, not a machine that takes in information and spits out a quote unquote right answer. The proximate stranger. While every parent-child relationship likely has its ups and downs, it is often closely bound by a shared history of care. That shared history would likely have a child, would likely lead a child to make decisions with his parents' well-being in mind, and vice versa. The action would simply happen. There would be little conscious thought. But what does the ethics of care have to say about how we treat people with whom we are not in caring relationships? Encountering strangers, those with whom we have no caring relationship, can, can and often does inspire the feeling of caring that exists in caring relationships. Perhaps a small child reminds you of your little cousin. Maybe a teenager on crutches reminds you of your teammate. The gleam in someone's eyes, the color of their backpack, or the tempo in their gait might make you remember someone who you're close to, someone who you have either cared for or been cared for by. Through those associations, you cultivate a relationship to strangers. The ethics of care places interdependence at its core. As such, it asks us to consider ethical care as an outgrowth of natural care. That is, we should use our natural caring relationships, friends, family relationships, neighborly relationships, to cultivate care for the quote-unquote proximate stranger, someone unknown but, also being human, able to receive and give care. Consider, for instance, that you are at a Sounders game, where the person sitting next to you suddenly enters a state of severe distress. They're suddenly shaking and sweating, and they seem like they're having a hard time staying in their seat. Whether or not you immediately identify with them, you have an obligation to assist them. If you are able, that might mean calling security or 911. It could be as simple as talking to them or offering them water. Whatever the help may be, your shared humanity connects you, and your history of caring relationships has taught you to care for others. As a good person, you follow that impulse to care. Now, what if that person were a Timbers fan, and you were attending a heated playoff game? Earlier before, earlier, before the sick person got sick, before the person got sick, you might have resented that they were sitting near you, wearing different team colors and singing different songs, how might that influence your impulse to care? It could diminish the impulse or even stop it completely. Divergent loyalties can divide people and make it more difficult to cultivate care for proximate strangers. The ethics of care can be held beyond direct connections and into the political sphere. Care ethicists like Virginia Held and Ned Nodding argue that the impulse to care should guide our legal and social institutions. They believe that an emphasis on caring relationships would create a more equal society based on compassionate human interactions. The systems that guide our society, schools, hospitals, law enforcement, arts, 
would then be designed to support interrelationship. A society built around the ethics of care would prioritize mutual well-being over the interests of individuals. A quick note to avoid common error. Decisions made using the ethics of care can, and often do, arrive at the same conclusions as those using other ethical frameworks. It is the reason for the, that decision that will dif differ. Decisions made using the ethics of care focus on respect for others and the importance of relationships. The dangers of gender essentialism. When considering the ethics of care, it is impossible to separate it from the gendered history of caring. In the European, in the history of European and American society, Caring has long been designated as quote unquote women's work. The burden of caring for children and the elderly has often fallen on women. So men in our society are often viewed as less compassionate, empathetic, and feeling. We know that these generations are not innate. They are socialized. As UNICEF notes, gender socialization is reinforced on individuals, individual social and structured levels throughout every society as girls grow up. And in adolescence, many girls are taught to, quote, be useful around the house, unquote, while boys are taught to be, quote unquote, wild and tough. Later on, young women are more likely to be pushed toward caring professions like nursing and teaching, while men are actively discouraged from such, such fields. If they have taught, if they have children, women are far more likely to be expected to take on the work of being the primary caregiver. This ex expectation applies when it comes to caring for elderly or ill loved ones as well. In the U.S., 66% of family caregivers are women. And yet, humans are humans of different genders are not born with different capacities for care. Rather, they are taught through parenting, schooling, media, and other social influences to behave according to certain gender norms. Unequal distribution of care is detrimental to people of all genders. The ethics of care sees the potential for care in all people, regardless of gender. In fact, it seeks to release women from the gender, excuse me, from the historical burdens of care by emphasizing all people's cooperation in caring relationships. But it's not only women who benefit. The ethics of care acknowledges and honors the place of men and non-binary people in networks of interdependence. By questioning traditional norms of gender performance, the ethics of care has much to offer humans across the spectrum of gender. Conclusion One of the newest major ethical frameworks we have studied, the ethics of care is both an ethical framework in its own right and a critique of older frameworks. The ethics of care challenges us to consider the relationships that shape our lives when making ethical choices and to use our intuition about how to care and be cared for to live better lives. It also points out what might be understood as a weakness in some earlier frameworks, especially in the Western tradition, a focus on the individual that can make it hard to see the interdependence that makes life possible and fulfilling. The ethics of care attends to the mutually caring relationships that constitute the context in which humans make ethical choices.